Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Uh, our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and this is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So I'm really, really pleased to have my good friend, uh, Richard Ha, today as our guest. Uh, Richard is a successful farmer, a thought leader, a man of action, and he makes things happen. Uh, today, we're going to be talking story about the the rubber slipper revolution and the need for speed in converting to a non -fuel, uh, fossil fuel economy. Uh, Richard, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it, Mitch? Glad it's to be going here. good. Yeah, it's <laughs> great to have you. Um, so, um, just to get into the overall subject, I want to ask you a, a, a question to kick this off. You know, you were a really successful farmer. You know, you're top of the game. You had happy employees. You were making money. You know, uh, farmers farm. When farmers make money, that's that's what you're uh, one of your famous sayings. Uh, but then something happened, and uh, you gave it all up. So, uh, what what happened to make you uh, change your whole business and, and get out of the business and uh, move on? So, tell tell us what what there was some significant thing that happened that made you take this action. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that started it off was we had to make a decision whether to refinance uh, in, into the farming, um, uh, continue farming. So we, we looked down the road and said, you know what, what, what things are, uh, the way things are going right now, the oil price is going up, uh, fossil fuel is declining, and uh, we, gotta, we should get out now while we can. And that's, that's the real reason why we got out. The pluses weren't going to exceed the minuses. And the, how we came to that decision was basically, in, you know, uh, at our website, we have, I, I wrote this book and I, I tell stories, uh, not I tell stories, Pop told stories as we were growing up when I was 10 years old. And those values lasted for 10 years. And that is really uh, how I, uh, you know, lead my whole life. You know, I, I didn't realize until much later that that's where it came from. But it came down to to uh, generations, and uh, right. that's basically. So, so Pop was your dad, right? Just so yes. everybody understands the lingo here in, in uh, Hawaii. And I want to point out that by doing this and looking down the road, uh, white water coming, what are you going to do? We're going to talk about that uh, as part of our slideshow is that, you know, uh, basically instead of waiting for it to all the bad stuff to happen and go out of business and, you know, fight all that, uh, he was able to get out at a good time and give his employees, really important, give his employees a soft landing so that they weren't uh, stressed out and they could either go to other jobs, you know, like I said, a soft landing, it wasn't, it wasn't a total uh, catastrophe for them and their families. And that's the kind of guy uh, that Richard is. And that's kind of looking ahead. And I don't want to uh, put words in your mouth, but that's something I understand your pops uh, taught you to do. Yep. You know, and okay. he wasn't really teaching it. He was just saying it. It just came down through generations, evidently. Okay. Well, let's go to uh, the first slide. And uh, in my slide deck. And so I was able to find this great picture of all these rubber slippers on a clothesline in so Hawaii. So I had to throw that in. But if you look down in the left-hand corner, you'll see the uh, logo for uh, the rubber slipper group uh, that uh, uh, Richard put together. I, I'm really impressed with that logo, Richard. It's really great. Is, are there any special things that we don't see in there by looking at that? You have like two slippers. Uh, what, what's kind of the meaning there? Well, you know what we're talking about is the 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 regular the regular people, yeah, right. And 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 that's why you know when you see the spelling and you see how it's it's described, automatically you know who we're talking about. We're talking about just the average average person, right. So, um, so why did you start, it, Richard? What was the what was the driver for putting together the rubber slipper? Let's talk about the group first, which is the organization. We can talk about the quote revolution as we uh, go go along through the uh, through the show. 
But what what drove you to start? I mean, it's pretty recent. So what's the when did you start it, and why, and how do you see it going? Well, you know, this started a long time ago when I went to the first uh, peak oil conference in 2007, and way before that. But back back then, when I came back and found out what was going on with peak oil, uh, we started to think, okay, what should we be doing? What can we be doing? To, to set ourselves up for, uh, to be at a better place. And that's, that's so that's why I helped to form the uh, uh, Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce. And then after that, we formed the uh, Sustainable Energy Hawaii. Then I turned on and then now I'm doing this. So it didn't happen just yesterday. It was a long-term okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's go to uh, the next slide, slide two. So uh, you wrote a really great little book uh, called What Would Our Kapuna Do? So first of all, for the non-Hawaii residents, uh, what is a kapuna anyway? What is that? It's uh, the, the older people. You know the people with white hair? Yes, you, I know some of those. White hair, you get the more, <laughs> you, you get the kapuna. It stands for wisdom, you know, having been alive for a long time and seen a lot of things. That's what it is. Well, I guess I'm a Kapuna too, though I'm not sure if I have the wisdom part nailed down yet. So, so uh, I see uh, it's free, uh, you say. And how do I get? It? How do I get it? Yeah. So you get on the website and you just click that that book, and then at the audio book uh, pops up, and that's free. And the reason I did that was, although it's on Amazon and uh, Kindle and available at at uh, basically books in Hilo. I wanted to make this free for the rubber slipper folks so that they could go in and just not have to pay anything. They could get it. So that's what that's about. So what's in the book? Just give us a kind of an overview of what, what it is and why we should uh, read it. Well, it, you know, it, it, it talks about how I grew up, how I was influenced by uh, values pop, uh, talked about, and uh, it traced some of the things that happened along the way. To get to here, so it was it, it it was just a description of why my life turned out the way it did. Right. Yeah. So okay. basically, that's what it is. You know, it's kind of entertaining, I think, because we we did a lot of things that were pretty stupid, but still we learned pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, your pops was a pretty uh pretty smart guy, as it turned out, and had a lot of wisdom, and I guess he passed that on to you, because you certainly have a lot of wisdom. You know, it, my pop only went to the fifth grade and he wasn't at all teaching us anything. He was just telling us stories. And right. the stories were so connected to the place, you know, the family land in Mapu down in uh, Puna that we, at 10 years old, I could understand exactly what he was saying and then and what it was implying. And he didn't say much more than that. And it just lasted all my life. All right. So let's go to the next slide, slide three. Um, opening our minds to possibility, we can become the change. So what, what, that's on, I, I, I uh, grabbed that from your website. So what do you mean by that, uh, Richard? Can you uh, tell us uh, how, what that means? I mean, we hear, we hear politicians talk about that, we can become the change, but what does this really mean to you in your mind? You know, so Bob always uh, encouraged uh, tell stories about looking in, in to where you want to go into the future and plan advance, you know, what uh, to anticipate uh, situations arising. So that's basically what it is, is trying to look ahead, understanding what the situation is today and trying to look ahead and trying to figure out uh, where we want to be in 10 years, one generation, you know, a thousand years, that kind of thing. Yeah. So part of the challenge is, you know, you can think about looking ahead and we produce all these great plants. Like I wrote a plan for the state about hydrogen about uh, 12 years ago now, and uh, nothing ever happened. We have these plans, but you got to take action uh, to make these plans happen and make your future happen, and not just sit back being passive and thinking, "Oh, gee, you know, everything is going to be okay." It's not necessarily going to be okay unless you take that action. So, do you would care to comment on that? Well, you know, I, I think you got to be practical too. So, so you plan where you want to be in the future, 
and and be flexible enough to make the moves that you got to make so that you it's not a straight line you go back and forth and you know and you get to the force the change to get to where you need to go um so so and, and like i say you got to be practical so there's no point in trying to trying to uh, uh grab five ten different subjects you know so for in my case I, I just looked at myself and said okay what can i actually do and what should i what space should i occupy and just I, i'm not an expert in, in a whole bunch of things but i do have some expertise in in these two areas so that that's what i've done for a long time okay so uh, let's kind of pull up the next slide because that this uh, carries on with this theme of uh, getting things done so uh, tell us about your mission, and uh, you, you you spent a lot of time talking about Keiki, uh, 25 years ahead, looking ahead 25 years. Uh, let's talk about that. And uh, I was able to snag this great picture you see up here on the right-hand side of baby's feet, you know, and uh, having the world, you know, you know how babies play in a crib, you know. So I thought that was really cool. I also have, uh, just to point it out in case the audience doesn't pick it up, because it took a bit of time to figure this out. Is hey, you have a globe, and then we have a uh, a, um, a sand, a sand uh, uh, timer. Uh, I forget what you call it, uh, a glass, uh, showing that the sands of time are running down here, guys. And uh, how much time have we really got left to sit around and talk before we do it? And then, of course, this picture here. I got to point this all out. Should so this picture shows us handing it from one generation to the other. You like uh, okay to the cakey at uh, twenty five years from now. And of course, we want to. Uh, solve the CO2 program. So now I have me having talked to Yak about this, Richard, uh, talk, talk about the mission. Yeah, you know, so let's talk about geothermal. Uh, it's a resource that we have, and only 1% in the world has this resource. And the thing about the, this resource is that it, it, it'll last for a million to two million years. So anything you base on that is a relatively safe safe bet. So that's one of the uh, two things that we, we, we push in our mission. The other one is the culture center of the cloud, which is a separate subject, but uh, I can talk about that if, if that's appropriate. So let's uh, pull up slide uh, five, which kind of illustrates what uh, uh, Richard was talking about. So let's, let's talk about these two things that we have, uh, Richard. Yeah, so, so when I went to these peak oil conferences, uh, the, the thing that I've, I realized early on was that the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding, and that was happening for 20 years. So it was pretty obvious, you know, I look around the room and say, holy smokes, I'm the only person from Hawaii here listening to this thing. And if that is true, how do I share that with uh, the people in Hawaii? So, so I already had that in my mind. And then, you know, as time, you know, started to think about it, one of the major resources we have uh, is, is geothermal. The other uh, infinite resource we have is the skies above us. We're not talking about Mount Kiana, we're talking about the skies. So those two resources will last forever. And if, if uh, fossil fuel is a declining uh, um, resource, that will decouple us from and make us safer as we go further, you know what I mean? generations after generations. Okay, now uh, let's uh, pull up slide six, the next slide. So uh, this, uh, this slide talks a little bit about energy and our dependence on oil. So uh, Richard, uh, uh, would you like to comment on, on how we're so dependent on oil and uh, what, what our electricity costs are doing to us? Yeah, you know, you're going back to uh, uh, what, what I picked up at the uh, Peacock Conference was that um, the energy in one barrel of oil used to get us 100 barrels back in the 1930s. Today, the energy in one barrel of oil gets us 10. Now that trend is scary. So, so we know we gotta get off of oil and we don't really have much time because we, we see what's happening in Ukraine. You know, that's Russia, uh, uh, weaponizing uh, uh, fossil fuel, and so uh, that's that's the uh, uh, that's one side. Uh, the other side 
uh, uh, not the other side, but another way of looking at it is there is a direct relationship between world fossil fuel production and world GDP. So as long as oil is cheap and increasing, everything's fine. We're just happy, right. you know, like how we are today. But then when we hit the peak and start coming down the other side, the thing to remember is that fossil fuel only makes up six and a half percent of GDP. So in other words, every time, every one percent decline is equal to a 15 percent shrinkage in GDP. Now that's scary. That means there's all kinds of implications to that. And, and who's going to uh, catch it? It's going to be the rubber slipper folks. Yeah, I mean, you, you demonstrated that yourself through your, you know, for, from what your farming days, where you, like you said, you looked ahead, you saw the costs were going up, and you just found, you know, you realized that in fullness of time, you couldn't make a living out of it. And uh, so you're, you know, you chose the time to get out of the business uh, while it was still good. But, you know, we, here we are in Hawaii, you know, our prices are continuing to mount, you know, our energy costs are not going down at all. Um, and that's driving people away from Hawaii. I was reading a statistic where we've lost in the last few years, we've lost about 16% of our uh, population because they can't make ends meet here in Hawaii. So what do they do? They go to the mainland where, you know, um, um, electricity is about a third of the cost. I think uh, in Texas, we pay about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, whereas here uh, it's 47 cents. Actually, at the Nelha site for my hydrogen plant, I'm, I paid my last bill, I was paying 49 cents for a kilowatt hour of electricity. And it's it's been going up, up, up. It never goes down. So that's driving people away. And it's yes. going to drive our keiki away. They're going to go to, you know, where they can make a living. And it's really hard to make a living here. Uh, and it's unsustainable here in so many ways. So basically, you know, one thing I got, we're kind of sleepwalking through our lives here in Hawaii, just hoping that something is going to happen that's going to be good and uh, slow walking it. How about, a, what and, do you think about that? And that's why we're here. And that's what, the, and that's why we're starting the rubber slip of revolution right now. <laughs> yeah, right. So what, what is the rubber slip of revolution? Yeah, so, so what we're, we're about is, we have this narrative about Kyoki and Malia, who are toddlers today. And uh, mm -hmm. we're asking the question, one generation from now, when they're 25 years old, what can we do now with the knowledge we have to make life better for them at that time? And 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 I took a long time trying to think of how I was going to message this thing. But you know what? When you message it like that, everybody loves kids. So right. when you when you have a discussion, you're not you're not yelling at each other anymore. You're you're you know, you can ask a question, hey, what what do you folks think we should do for Kyoki and Malia? And that whole discussion changes. And then all of a sudden, we're all looking in the same direction into the future. Well, the next slide shows uh, one of those kids with the bright idea. Let's throw it up. So let's talk a little bit more about the energy solutions we have here, Richard. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not rocket science, you know. So we have geothermal. And from geothermal, we can make green electricity. And if we run green electricity through water, we can make green hydrogen. And why that's important is because the high heat of hydrogen can take you to ammonia. And ammonia is where we really want to go because ammonia is part of the uh, uh, NH3 is, is nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, so right. farmers are real concerned about that for fertilizer. And, and uh, ammonia is a better a carrier of hydrogen than hydrogen itself because you don't have to spend all that money squeezing it down, compressing it, and doing all that stuff. And, using the uh, and the third thing about ammonia, which is pretty amazing, is that it's a fuel. You know, right now, there are people, uh, uh, the Castro Initiative, they're trying to decarbonize the whole maritime industry with ammonia. And can we position ourselves to be a player in that field? Because then we can increase our manufacturing base, we can bring in money into the economy, and we can hopefully keep our kiki over here home. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, 
I'd just like to focus a little bit about the use of ammonia as a fertilizer. I mean, uh, ammonia was developed uh, at mass scale back in the 1920s, I think, or, or earlier than that, 1910 or so. And what it does, did, it quadrupled the uh, production capacity of our land. And that's why we're able to produce so much food, uh, food now is because of ammonia uh, being able to develop, you know, you can produce four times the crop you could in the old days when they just spread manure on the fields. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a good thing. Um, and uh, now we see that with now ammonia is now pretty well made from natural gas. And now with the Ukrainian situation where uh, natural gas has really uh, exploded and you know, so wrong expression, I don't want to use exploded, has really gone up in cost. Um, I mean, significantly, almost exponentially, and that's really killing uh, the ammonia, the cost of ammonia, and also it's going to be not very good for our farmers. So there, there's a perfect example of how we could produce ammonia ourselves for our own consumption. And, you know, we've got such a great resource here, we could probably export it. Um, I hear people are looking at shipping for actual ships, are using it as a fuel for ships, and we could be a depot here or a bunker where we supply fuel to these ships you know, from all over the world. So uh, it's, it, it, we have the resources, we have water, we have uh, a geothermal energy, which is a base load. So we can actually make a geoth uh, uh, ammonia fairly easily. Yes, and you know, uh, looking into the future and understanding the size of our market, which is our state, uh, we cannot do the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber Bosch process is so huge, it's too big for us. So we've right. got to look at other alternatives to that will uh, be compatible with the scale of the island. So, so basically what people are uh, experimenting with and a little bit more than experimenting, they're, they're looking at ways to make uh, ammonia without going through the Haber Bosch process. Like for example, you know, you run electricity to water, you get uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Then if you do the same kind of process using air and pull the nitrogen out of air, you get ammonia. But right. like I said, not the Haber-Bosch process. So if people come in and say, oh, this is wonderful. We want to go to Hawaii and do the Haber-Bosch process. No, I'm sorry, get out of here. We're not talking that. We're talking something appropriate to our scale. All right, uh, exactly. So let's uh, pull up slide uh, eight. So we're on the downward slope here of the show. So we got about four minutes to go, Richard, four and a half minutes to go. So anyway, I found this uh, in my list of uh, pictures. I had uh, you know, two snails running to a, a goal line. So it, I, I want to uh, emphasize the need for speed. And uh, you know, you know, we have an opportunity to be uh, leaders and it starts today and we just can't sit around and talk about it. So that, that's part of the rubber slipper revolution that we've been talking about. So uh, comment on that if you care to. Yeah, so so we gotta go, we gotta get into the hydrogen economy. What is the fastest way to do that? And that is to set up a five station hydrogen refueling station That's what we've been talking about. Uh, now, what do they require? They require 10 cents a kilowatt hour cost. You know, and oh, so the, so the, on, for on the electricity. Way, yeah, for electricity. the electricity. Yes. Right. So, you know, the cost of uh, 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 geothermal, when it's full production, you know, 46 megawatts, is only about six and a half cents. So there's a margin in there. So the utility can make a, a little bit of a margin from uh, doing stuff that they otherwise wouldn't, you know, like uh, diesel trucks and uh, that kind of thing. So, right. uh, so that, it's really important that we get that going because once we get that going, we can tell the whole world, listen, we are in the hydrogen economy now. And then people will look around, well, holy smokes, let's go over there and do some test projects. Yeah, build it and they will come. Yes. I'm, I'm seeing that now with my hydrogen station over at Nelha. You know, we, we're, we've uh, got one major oil company coming to visit us in, uh, in December because they heard about the station, they want to check it out. So. And then we had another group who comes and they want to test out their fuel cells. So exactly what you said, we're like kind of a living laboratory here in Hawaii. And now once you have the basics in place, then people are going to start coming here. 
So I, I'd like to throw up the next slide, slide nine. And uh, I, I think this is a video that uh, I'm not sure who produced it. Uh, Richard, is that one of your productions or what? Uh, what what's yeah. uh, Tell us about this. Yeah, the, these videos are, are, we made it ourselves, you know, it's uh, iPhone and, and me oh, talking. Really? Yeah. yeah, and I, I you know, I, I did this with Alexi Kakpo. He's a really talented guy and he has a right. big world vision, you know, so I worked really good with him. He taught, he taught me how to, how to, how to talk because <laughs> I would be real monotone, you know, like that. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that book I wrote, we put it all on, uh, 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 I narrated the whole thing. That's how come it's an audio copy. And these videos are all the same cool. way put together. You know, so where just, can we get this video on geothermal? Is that on the, uh, it's on the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the rubber slipper group uh, website? There yeah. it is. There's how you can get it. Uh, and oh, I want to point out this picture of the uh, geothermal, the, uh, the lava flowing in the ocean. Uh, we took that when we did a tour with Captain Lava. It was uh, getting near sunset, and it was fantastic uh, watching the lava flow into the ocean. And actually, when it hits the water, it turns into rock, but it's it's porous, so it floats for a while. So you're mm -hmm. you're out there in the middle of all these floating rocks and all the steam and everything else like that. But that's the raw power that we're talking about for geothermal. And like uh, Richard said, we have a lot of it. Not not just uh, in, on one island. Uh, there's potential on all islands, and that's what we've got to get after. So um, we've got about a minute, uh, well, even less than a minute to go. So let's go to the last slide, which um, talks about how, uh, you know, uh, how you can join the movement. So let's talk about the movement, uh, the revolution, and whatever you want to call it, uh, Richard. Uh, tell us about that and, uh, and what your thoughts are on it. Well, you know, I've been asked to, to give talks. Yeah? So I've given several talks, uh, um, Rotary clubs, uh, uh, chambers, and stuff like that. And the, the, the uh, response is incredible. Everybody knows that something ain't right. We got to do something. So, so it, 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 it's, it's gaining momentum. But I wanted to say one thing. And, you know, uh, I, I, I've been going to uh, uh, Kikui, uh, Halau Ohia, uh, Kikui, uh, uh, Keali, uh, Kanako Ole. And um, I wanted to make sure that I, I said that Everything that I'm saying has a basis in Hawaiian uh, thought processes that, and that's how the knowledge that I have came down, it came down to generations. And, and uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing for me to finally realize. And I didn't even realize it until the last year, you know, so uh, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Oh, that's great. So uh, you can, uh, if you access the, uh, the Rubber Slipper Group website, you have a spot, you have a click, where you can click on and join the group. There it is, uh, yeah. that little uh, thing right in there. And yes. uh, just put in your uh, email and then you can be a part of the group and get information yeah. as it comes up and updates. Is that correct? That's how it works. Yeah. Okay, so, we so we're gonna have to leave it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. We're not really asking for a lot of participation, but moral support and coming together when it's important. Yeah, so right. if there's a bill that's coming up, you know, can, can you folks, support this or that, yeah. Okay, so it's a chance to talk story and talk about the the uh, the problems and the solutions. Is that, is that a good way of putting it? Oh yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay, so uh, we're gonna have to leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii and talking story with Richard Ha, founder and leader of the Rubba Slippa Group. Um, today we've been talking about the need for speed in transitioning to a fossil of uh, free uh, economy. Uh, thank you so much, R Richard, for all your leadership and for all the things you do for Hawaii. Good. And all thanks right. to our viewers. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And thanks to all our viewers tuning in. And if you like what you see, make sure your friends and family and all, everything, everybody in your network hears about it. So this is Mitch and I'll see you in about two weeks. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.